Hi, this is Fadu Daib. You're watching Spotlight on Africa Connect. Welcome to Spotlight on African Connect. Today we have the pleasure of talking to Mrs. Paduma. We just met this amazing, incredible woman at the Harvard Kennedy School. Her story of courage and sacrifice and strength made her my inspiration. I know at the end of this program today, you two will come away with the same conclusion, that she is not just an inspirational woman for, for to every young girl in her hometown of Somalia. She has become an inspiration to every young woman, every young girl around the globe. That is what I call a super, an African superwoman. Hello, Ms. Paduma, how are you? I'm fine, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to your show. Thank you, it's my pleasure. I just, before we start, I have so many questions, obviously, to ask you, but I just wanted to say you have been an incredible inspiration to me, not just to me. I know there are so many people looking up to you right now and say, yes, we, this is what we have been, African women have been missing. And I just want to say for that, thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. And so many people still have questions. I know since you announced you're running to be the first female president of Somalia, um, so many people still want to know who is Mrs. Waduma. Please, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, indeed, um, I, I get a lot of interest as to who I am and why I'm doing this. I have said on so many, several um, different media outlets that I'm a Somali woman. I am a mother of four children, a wife of almost 25 years. And I'm also a student of life, um, currently also trying to, to do something about my country. And that is why I'm running for the presidency in, in, in Somalia. Talking about you being a Somali woman, as I am an African woman as, as well, I, I would say, before I met you, I've heard it all. I've seen, I've seen everything. But a quote from you, you said, um, as a Somalia woman, I have died four times. That really, um, I won't, I, I'm not going to say, uh, it left me speechless, really. Please, can you tell us more? What, what do you mean by, as a Somalia woman, I, have, I died four times? What I mean is, this is a metaphorical way of expressing something. If you look at poverty and the disadvantage that Somali women and also African women face in the continent, I'm talking about maternal mortality. I'm talking about um, neonatal uh, infant mortality. I'm talking about um, girls who are sens senselessly mutilated and who die in the process of mutilation. I'm talking about certain cultures and traditions that um, increase but also contribute to po poverty, such as early marriage, and I'm talking about um, physical violence um, that women and girls face. So those stages of death put together portray these issues that I'm talking about. So many of us have dreams, and sometimes we don't live up to our our dreams, I should say, and what is that? What was that moment? When did you just wake up in the morning and just decide, okay, I'm going to run for president of be the first female president of Somalia? What was it that inspired you to say, okay, this is my calling. This is time for me to take this bold step to change the, the conversation in Africa. What was it like for you? What is this inspiration behind this? I am born to two poor parents. I was born into disadvantage. But I was also born with a social conscience, which a lot of us have. Some of us tend to mute that, others live with it. I have always wanted to do something for my continent, for my country. And I've always thought of ways of doing it. But I've come, I came to the realization that what we need to do is not really to try and mend small cracks or uh, scars that we see. You put a Band-Aid on it, but really it is to 
to, to try and heal that wound. And by doing so, you have to change ways of living, ways of doing things, social norms, traditions, cultures that are very, are very dangerous to the way we live. I'm not saying that everything about us is dangerous. Our cultures, our traditions are very unique to us and they're very good. But there are also sides that we need to give up or either we need to um, sort of reevaluate and, and make sure that those are things that we can, we can manage. I've always thought about this and for me, wanting to change and to spark social change was a lifelong process. It's just manifesting itself now, but I've always thought about it. We know that you have been receiving death threats, and at the same time, the overwhelming support from Somalians, Africans are really there for you. So how, did, how is your family taking this um, bold step you are taking? What I'm doing is not unique um, to only me. Mm -hmm. It's unique to millions of women yes. all over the world. Anyone who wants to go into leadership, particularly if they happen to be a woman, mm -hmm. they face the same challenges. One example I want to give you is Hillary Clinton. She faces the same challenges, if not more on a grander scale than I do. And she's not a Somali woman, she's not an African woman, she's not a Muslim. Uh, but still, because of her gender, that's what she faces. So this is a gender issue. This is an issue that all women who break out of the stereotype that the, the roles that we've been ascribed to, mm -hmm. they face this kind of things. Oftentimes you will not hear this kind of questions being asked of male um, politicians mm -hmm. or people of that gender who aspire to go into politics. Um, my family is fully supportive. They've always supported me in whatever I do. I don't like discussing them because it's not their, their, their role um, that we're talking about. And I don't want to put a lot of um, 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 light on them because they deserve the privacy that um, they want. As as for the death threats, as I had mentioned, uh, a lot of us would get that. Women get that. And anyone who wants to spark social change will find this kind of uh, problems. Because people fear. People fear new things. People fear things that they don't know. And the only way they can react to that is to try and protect themselves. And this is what happens. So the challenge is not really one that is only applicable to Fadumo or any other woman um, in, in Africa. It's a global challenge that women, wherever they are, th that they face and they will continue to face unless something is done about it. When I was growing up, I, I loved to be, um, I always look at myself, that I, I always tell myself that I wanted to be a governor, I wanted to be a president, but I never really saw a woman in the race of running on any office. The only place I saw a woman in the political arena in Africa, Nigeria, where I come from, was the, when the men are coming, the politicians, the men are coming to town, they need the women to cook for them. That is the only way women show up in the campaigns. What do you think your candidacy, or how, how do you think your candidacy will change the conversation for every woman that has ever thought about running for an office, or what do you want them to take away from your, from, from this race? I was brought up by a very strong woman. My mother's nickname, by the way, was Gorbachev because of being, she's a very strong woman and strong-minded in her own way. Mm -hmm. And so that was the nickname that was given to her. I grew up um, living with this very strong being whom I loved more than life itself. And as a young child, I remember in the 80s as a young girl, there was a female presidential candidate. Mm. I, I, I was very amazed to, to see this, um, this uh, female running um, for the presidency. So this, the notion of a female candidate running isn't new to us uh, in Somalia, neither is it new to the continent. Um, but somehow, the, the, we have a misleading notion of leadership. Leadership is, is ascribed to a certain gender, 
um, you have to look a certain way. Even if you are a man, you have to be over the age of 50, 60, 70. Uh, you have to look a certain way in order for people to assume that, or even allow you to go into leadership, because that's the mentality we are brought up with. And so I want to say this to, to the youth and um, to a lot of people also uh, who are young at heart, because there's many of us <laughs> <laughs> like, like that, that you can do whatever you want to do. No one can stop you from doing that. If that's something you want to do, is that something you aspire to, go for it. I think what happens most of the time is we are shackled, our thinking, our mentality shackles us. And if you free yourself, what, what is to stop you from doing what is right? Because at the end of the day, it's about being right and doing what is right. And once you know that, then go for it. We can only change things by stepping forward and taking that responsibility. Thank you so much. I, I definitely think that you are one woman that uh, every, every young girl will see and say, I want to be like her when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm growing old. Me, I really, really don't want to be like you when I'm, when I'm your age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet. But anyway, uh, I want African Connect to be the first to be the first pr yeah, program that you would say this. I know it's still early. I'm a true believer of your, of this mission you're on because I believe in you. If you are elected today to be the first female president of Somalia, what are the five things, five agenda initiatives that you would definitely put in place? Now, I have to tell you that I'm not a politician. Yes. Because at this juncture, this is when I should kick into action and promise you everything that is between the earth and the skies. Mm -hmm. Tell you what you need to hear. But I'm not um, a politician. And I say this because I don't make a livelihood out of politics. I don't get paid to do politics. Four years is a very short time to do much. My platform is on security and economic development. Within that falls job creation for youth because we have 85 percent of the Somali population is under the age of 35 so job creation is very very important um, I am also looking at basic infrastructure rebuilding reconstructing that I'm looking at education because without that it's very difficult to try and and, and, and give livelihood to 80, um, 85% of the Somali population. I'm looking at reintegration of the displaced communities. I'm looking at health care. And there, the needs are various. There are so many, but you have to prioritize. Four years is a very short time. So really looking at economic development and looking at security, which disarmament is, is part of that. You look at also um, um, reintegration of of the militias, of the people who are armed into, into the society. I'm looking at truth and reconciliations as a way of really uh, stabilizing the situation in Somalia. Four years, if you're capable and able to do that within four years, then the rest can be done. But initial four years is really to get the country back on its feet, is to give people the dignity that they require, put food in their bellies, let them go to school, let their children have stability and go to school, let them have access to health care and roofs over their heads. So that's what four years can, can help us achieve. If we're given that opportunity, because getting the opportunity is something else. The people who have wanted and who have perpetuated this conflict because this is the way they make a living, this is the way they exist. And they will do everything possible to make sure that that conflict continues because that is their livelihood. That's their way they've always lived. And this is across the continent. So it's not only changing mindsets and societies, it's also trying to really fight with these external um, factors that will do everything possible to stop you from doing that. Well, you see today, there's so many um, people using in the name of culture or tradition to do evil things. And especially going back to uh, Africa again, 
where I come because sometimes I have to use myself to make an example because that is where I really I came from. That is what I understand. Some 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 in the, in the last four or five years, the child bride issue has really gone up. How do you see us trying to uh, educate this, especially um, our par the parents of these young girls, this a 12 years old girl getting into a marriage from four with a 50 years old man? You know, is this a cultural um, thing that is blowing up again, or do we start? Edu how do we start educating families to know that the best way for any child to gain life in this world is by education first, not marriage. This is something that is linked to poverty. Sometimes when child brides are given away, it's because the family um, does that in order for her to be economically supported and for them to get that support as well. I think it's time we understood that Education is the key to life. If you educate your children, you educate your girls, you don't have to marry them off at the age of 12 or 13 because they can make their own livelihood. And in the process, they can help you. I think these parents love their children. I don't want us to say that they don't love their children. That's why they're doing this. This is also part of the bad culture that we have and, and some of the negative uh, practices that we have in our countries. But just like my mother gave me the opportunity to, uh, to study, she gave me the key to life which was education. I think all mothers and fathers in the continent should be able to do that. But it's very difficult convincing a parent who has 10 or 12 or even 14 children and who all need feeding that this is the way to go because without the proper support, without money, resources and means, they can't do that. This is an issue of, of government investing in education. The government needs to invest in education, but the government can't reprogram a society mm -hmm. to think differently and to do things differently. Even when education is provided, you will see sometimes that girls are not allowed to go to school. So it's, it's not a tradition. It's culture. tradition, yeah. So we have to do, the work that we have to do is really immense. And it requires different tools. It requires different ways of doing and thinking and doing things. And, and, and so changing the mindset of a society requires certain resources and so giving education is not the only solution it's really eradicating poverty because when you do that studies show globally uh, that also people and societies change for the better you know um, when we talk about tradition we have to talk about religion as well um, I know that so many people will have questions about your, your religion, how you able to run as a woman. You know, being from Somalia, women are not allowed to do so many things. So how does the role of religion play into this race? This is very important. This is uh, something that I get asked quite frequently. And um, if you are on social media and you visit my public Facebook page, you will find a uh, majority of the people who have an issue with me running for, um, for the presidency um, always use the argument of religion and they use a particular hadith um, to disqualify or dissuade me from running for office. And I have spoken to religious um, elders and imams on this issue. I. I find this a very, very difficult question actually to deal with and oftentimes I don't engage people on social media because I know that it is not a constructive way of doing it. I want to say one thing, Islam gave women rights long before any of the other religions did that. And Somali women have rights, they've always had rights, 
The difference is that these rights have been infringed upon and they have been taken away. And one way of taking away these rights is by actually trying to dissuade women from taking the rightful position in their society. Either you use culture or you use religion to do that. Now, the Quran says nothing about women not taking leadership positions. On the contrary, the Quran gives a very good example of Queen Sheba, you call her Queen Sheba. And her leadership is given as a very good example of just and fair leadership. People use the Hadith, Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari as, as, a, as, as a Hadith. But what I say to this is that I am a Muslim, I believe in the Quran. The Hadith cannot be used to negate the Quran. It is there to supplement, to complement the Quran. Now, if you look at the context of that hadith, it applies to a certain context. You cannot translate the religion or certain hadiths to suit a certain agenda. In Medina, during the, the time of the Prophet's time, uh, peace be upon him, there's a woman who was given the position to lead a market and she oversaw that market which meant men also reported to her she was actually a leader in that market running a country is very similar to that I am not trying to run the Islamic nation I am not the leader of the Kali or a caliphate I'm not the leader of the Islamic Ummah that's a different thing I'm a leader of a country I'm trying to lead a country a person, a female, even a male, doesn't lead a country on their own. They do it in collaboration with others. No one makes decisions on their own. They shouldn't be doing that. And so the context that people are using, the hadith that they're using, is not applicable to the situation in Somalia. If we're talking about Somalia being a religious country, a religious environment, how do you expect explain all the atrocities that are going on in Somalia. People say that a country that is led by a woman will perish. Or if that is the case, for 25 years, for all these years, we've had men leading Somalia. How do you explain that phenomenon? And why don't you use religious text to dissuade Al-Shabaab and like-minded people from killing innocent children and women? Why do you have the need to use a religious script when a woman wants to do the rightful thing. And can you say that what is happening in Somalia is Islamically correct? Can you say that what is being done in Somalia is the Islamic way of doing things? So what I want to say is, yes, there is fear. And that is part of the reason why people use religious scriptures to to disqualify women or dissuade that. What I'm saying is that let's look at the context of the hadith, let's look at the religion. You cannot cherry pick. This. It is precisely because of this that Al-Shabaab is killing people when they are deep in prayer in the mosques, calling themselves Muslims. How do you explain that? How do you explain the raping of children and women? How do you explain the pillaging of the natural resources of the country. How do you explain all of these things if we are going to go and use religion as the thing, as the weapon to use against women? I want you to know, I want to finish this by saying that Islam has given women rights. Let us not distort the religion to use as an agenda, as a means of oppressing people and taking away their rights. Thank you so much. I was going to say before we go, if there is one thing, one message that you have for everyone that is supporting you, even the, the ones that are still not supporting you, if there is one message you have for them, what will it be? I, I have a lot of supporters. Even the ones that support me, I think that is a way of supporting me as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I want 
I want to say one thing. Um, what the continent needs is really a new way of thinking, is a new way of doing things. Oftentimes we hear that, oh, if you're under the age of 70 or 60, you are, you are the leader of the future. I want people to understand, no, we are the leaders of today, not tomorrow. Because we are not even sure we will get to tomorrow at the rate we are going at <laughs> and what is happening in this world. So we have to take matters into our own hands. So today is our day, not tomorrow. So this is the message I want to give to all the, the youth of Africa. I want to give this to also the elders that it doesn't mean that we are pushing you aside. We are just saying that you have had your time. We have seen what you are capable of doing. We thank you for all the struggles um, and the accomplishments that you have made. But now it's time for us, and we will take care of you. Have no worries about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I will just want to leave you guys with this. I hope you guys were inspired, truly the way I was inspired by Ms. Fadoma. And if you still have some, some questions for Ms. Fadoma, or you have been inspired by anything that she has said today, we would love to hear from you. You can send us an email on info at africanconnectonline.com. We will pass the message along to her. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Bye-bye. السلام عليكم مقاعي قفاضة مقاسم ضيبة اللي يراه ذا وحان أطر تمايا أحفيسك وغسر يا سومالي ومدح بينيني مضاء وحان ربي الهاي إنا نوم هد عديو انتي ولا لهي قاعد وقالسو حريرة سوشيال ميديا ذا وقولي رجالين آيو فالكان أن أن كسو عضو ويجيد كان أن كسو عضو وحان ربي الهاي إنا نوم هد عديو ونده ولا ليال وقد مهد سنتين وانا كفرح سنة إنا يقول يرجل النيسان إنا فلك أن كل خاقو أن سي وضو وحرب الله إنا أمهد عديو سيبا إنت كلت وايكن يقول سحريرتي أول والكود إيشي جاي ولا ولا لي محن كده دلك وقت كان حاضر كديار كوما أهن وحالقي يا ما إن دبات الجوجل سو حرب إنا أشي جو أن ولا ليال هذا إنا ما أنت دلك أن ديار إن قرم إنا خنطونا بري لما سوق دانه بري دم بنا ملي سوق دانه مرحلة دمان تي حنطة ما أنت لو بهين وحلا جا خبطة مركا وحن جعلان لها إن أي كان أن قعد صدام له ولا ليالو إيش وشجع وحلا دو أركتان سو حن وحن جوجين دانه ما أهن سحلو أركتان محن كقبان كرنا ذلك سو حن وو قبان كرنا وحن رب لها إن أم هد عديو أنت دياس برد جوكتو أن سومالي جوكتو إيميل كسي جوكتو أو إن يقال سو حريرة فيسبوك يقال سو حريرة تويتر يقال سو حريرة إيميل كيجا أو مركز تنا يقول الطليو أو إذا ها إمام سوماليا وحرب الله إنهم أشياءه إن شاء الله مردو إن إمام دونه دو إلى نفط يقسمه أو أن حمر أن كسودين دونه وقدم بيسنا وحرب الله إن إن ده ولا ليال رمضان سو صعدو مسلمنا هنا وقتي أو شون كانوا بالعمل دونه سد الله سعتنا وحن كطلا جرائنا نحمر أن إماضو سومالي أن إماضو وحن ربي الله إنا نقعد صدو إنا ديدو عيسان حدي وحن أنسو بناي إنا قن دونا نوحد دات كينا دال كينا يدين تين وحو تري دونا وحن نقعد سنا إنا يقودو عيسان فاتحة إيقو مرتان إلهي إنو إيوافة جيو جيتك سحاء حدي وحن إنا قن دونا وحفد نكيني دونا أما دات دبات أن وقيسان دونا أما روش که این دانتا و حال نگاه ات سنايا اینا دیدو عیسیان و فاتحی مرتان اله اینو نجت کاسی مرسینن آنیگا ایگا معدو مذهبی نیما ایگا معدو کرسی گس لانتی سوان نولان کراوان سوان نولان جریوان نولان دانا و حال روانی اند ضحو قبط دلک و حال نوقبط به خیر ایو جر و لالیالو و حال نگاه ات سنايا اینا دیدو عیسیان اله اینو یوافت جیو و حال ن ربی له اینا نیم هد عیو وأنا أقول لك أنها هي 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 هي
نبتقليو إن شاء الله نوا نسأرك دونا مرن فوجين سمالة إيمان دونا وأنا كل ما هتسنتين ولا ليان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله